Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 608, Bastille. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. It is cold outside, and I got to walk across the bridge with it windy and cold, and my nose was runny, and I was happy. <laughs> Those two things don't sound like they should go together, but they did, and it was lovely, and it was post-storm, so it was kind of, you know, one of those skies that looks like, oh, like a big pirate ship needed to be sailing in front of it. It was really beautiful. So there's that. For those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, at least above a certain latitude, there is a hint of fall, and that is lovely. And you may be wondering, why did Heather name this episode Bastille? It is not because Joan is going to the Bastille. That would be silly. No, it's for a sillier reason, because Alcatraz versus the Evil Librarians, book six, is out, and it is Bastille versus the Evil Librarians, told from the point of view of Bastille, the Knights of Cristal, and narrated by, I think her name is Susie Thompson. I don't know how they did it, but they found a female reader who can match Ramon de Ocampo, snarky note, for snarky note. They are beautiful in their pairing of how they read these very funny Brendan Sanderson books. So I know many of us have read them, books one through five. Now book six is out in audio, and I'm happy to be the one bearing such joyful news because laughs are good, I think, and they are very silly, but in a really smart way. Kind of the same way that Anne of Green Gables is a book for smart bookish girls. These are books for smart bookish people. You just have to be willing to laugh at some absurd things as well. Anyway, hard sell over. That's pretty much it. It's been that and getting ready for Ireland and trying to learn some German so that I'm not completely clueless when I go visit my sister with my mom. My mom has been learning German for the last year or so. <laughs> I know I can ride on her coattails as well, but at least I will be able to understand a little bit. So Duolingo and I have been frolicking with each other quite a bit lately. I have managed to deply quite a bit of the silk. I don't know if I will have deplied enough to be able to make a pair of socks yet. I think I'm going to have to deply a little bit more before I can do that. But either way, Candy was on the call with us last night when I managed to complete one of the total deplyings. And that was a happy moment. So I got to reply a little bit last night and I felt, I felt like I'd achieved something. I don't know what, <laughs> but, but it definitely felt like an achievement after all that time. So Joan, our second Joan chapter of three today is quite long, comparatively speaking, compared to other chapters we've had. So I wanted to get to it, but there is a word that is going to be used over and over and over and over and over and over today. And that word is abjure, A-B-J-U-R-E. It is not a word we use a lot anymore, but it is a word that could be used a lot these days. It is to renounce, to retract something, especially in kind of a formal situation or a very solemn situation, to recant, to renounce under oath to forswear. It's a serious word, and it is important, I think, that the word oath is included in there to give up or to renounce something under oath. Because along with the solemnity, there's a closed door vibe to this word. Like once you've done it, you can't do givebacks. It's not something you can really go back on. Or at least it's not something that you should go back on or feel easy about going back on. It's hard. It should be hard. I think that's everything I need to say about that word. 
And actually, I think that is the last thing I need to say before we dive in. So here we go with book three, chapters 19 through 21 of Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain, read for us by John Greenman. Here we go. Book 3, Chapter 19, Our Last Hopes of Rescue Fail. Joan had been adjudged guilty of heresy, sorcery, and all the other terrible crimes set forth in the Twelve Articles, and her life was in Cochon's hands at last. He could send her to the stake at once. His work was finished now, you think? He was satisfied? Not at all. What would his archbishopric be worth if the people should get the idea into their heads that this faction of interested priests, slaving under the English lash, had wrongly condemned and burned Joan of Arc, deliverer of France? That would be to make of her a holy martyr. Then her spirit would rise from her body's ashes a thousandfold reinforced, and sweep the English domination into the sea, and Cochon along with it. No, the victory was not complete yet. Joan's guilt must be established by evidence which would satisfy the people. Where was that evidence to be found? There was only one person in the world who could furnish it, Joan of Arc herself. She must condemn herself, and in public, at least, she must seem to do it. But how was this to be managed? Weeks had been spent already in trying to get her to surrender, time wholly wasted. What was to persuade her now? Torture had been threatened, the fire had been threatened. What was left? Illness, deadly fatigue, and the sight of the fire, the presence of the fire. That was left. Now that was a shrewd thought. She was but a girl, after all, and, under illness and exhaustion, subject to a girl's weaknesses. Yes, it was shrewdly thought. She had tacitly said herself that, under the bitter pains of the rack, they would be able to extort a false confession from her. It was a hint worth remembering, and it was remembered. She had furnished another hint at the same time, that as soon as the pains were gone, she would retract the confession. That hint was also remembered. She had, herself, taught them what to do, you see. First, they must wear out her strength, then frighten her with the fire. Second, while the fright was on her, she must be made to sign a paper. But she would demand a reading of the paper. They could not venture to refuse this, with the public there to hear. Suppose that during the reading her courage should return. She would refuse to sign, then. Very well. Even that difficulty could be got over. They could read a short paper of no importance, then slip a long and deadly one into its place, and trick her into signing that. Yet there was still one other difficulty. If they made her seem to abjure, that would free her from the death penalty. They could keep her in a prison of the church, but they could not kill her. That would not answer, for only her death would content the English. Alive she was a terror, in a prison or out of it. She had escaped from two prisons already. But even that difficulty could be managed. Cochon would make promises to her. In return, she would promise to leave off the male dress. He would violate his promises, and that would so situate her that she would not be able to keep hers. Her lapse would condemn her to the stake, and the stake would be ready. These were the several moves. There was nothing to do but to make them, each in its order, and the game was won. One might almost name the day that the betrayed girl, the most innocent creature in France and the noblest, would go to her pitiful death. The world knows now that Cochon's plan was as I have sketched it to you, but the world did not know it at that time. There are sufficient indications that Warwick and all the other English chiefs except the highest one, the Cardinal of Winchester, were not let into the secret, also that only Loiseleur and Beaupère on the French side knew the scheme. Sometimes I have doubted if even Loiseleur and Beaupère knew the whole of it at first. However, if any did, it was these two. It is usual to let the condemned pass their last night of life in peace, but this grace was denied to poor Joan, if one may credit the rumors of the time. Loiseleur was smuggled into her presence, and in the character of priest, friend, and secret partisan of France, and hater of England, he spent some hours in beseeching her to do the only right and righteous thing, 
submit to the church, as a good Christian should, and that then she would straightway get out of the clutches of the dreaded English and be transferred to the church's prison, where she would be honorably used and have women about her for jailers. He knew where to touch her. He knew how odious to her was the presence of her rough and profane English guards. He knew that her voices had vaguely promised something which she interpreted to be escape, rescue, release of some sort, and the chance to burst upon France once more and victoriously complete the great work which she had been commissioned of heaven to do. Also there was that other thing. If her failing body could be further weakened by loss of rest and sleep now, her tired mind would be dazed and drowsy on the morrow, and in ill condition to stand out against persuasions, threats, and the sight of the stake, and also be purblind to traps and snares which it would be swift to detect when in its normal estate. I do not need to tell you that there was no rest for me that night, nor for Noel. We went to the main gate of the city before nightfall with a hope in our minds, based upon that vague prophecy of Joan's voices which seemed to promise a rescue by force at the last moment. The immense news had flown swiftly far and wide that at last Joan of Arc was condemned, and would be sentenced and burned alive on the morrow. And so crowds of people were flowing in at the gate, and other crowds were being refused admission by the soldiery, these being people who brought doubtful passes or none at all. We scanned these crowds eagerly, but there was nothing about them to indicate that they were our old war comrades in disguise, and certainly there were no familiar faces among them. And so, when the gate was closed at last, we turned away grieved, and more disappointed than we cared to admit either in speech or thought. The streets were surging tides of excited men. It was difficult to make one's way. Toward midnight our aimless tramp brought us to the neighborhood of the beautiful church of St. Ouen, and there all was bustle and work. The square was a wilderness of torches and people, and through a guarded passage dividing the pack, laborers were carrying planks and timbers and disappearing with them through the gate of the churchyard. We asked what was going forward. The answer was, Scaffolds! and the stake. Don't you know that the French witch is to be burned in the morning? Then we went away. We had no heart for that place. At dawn we were at the city gate again, this time with a hope which our wearied bodies and fevered minds magnified into a large probability. We had heard a report that the abbot of Jumiege, with all his monks, was coming to witness the burning. Our desire, abetted by our imagination, turned those nine hundred monks into Joan's old campaigners, and their abbot into Laire, or the Bastard, or D'Alençon, and we watched them file in unchallenged, the multitude respectfully dividing and uncovering while they passed, with our hearts in our throats and our eyes swimming with tears of joy and pride and exultation, and we tried to catch glimpses of the faces under the cowls, and were prepared to give signal to any recognized face that we were Joan's men, and ready and eager to kill and be killed in the good cause. How foolish we were! But we were young, you know, and youth hopeth all things, believeth all things. End of chapter 19 Book 3, Chapter 20 The Betrayal In the morning I was at my official post. It was on a platform raised the height of a man, in the churchyard, under the eaves of St. Juan. On this same platform was a crowd of priests and important citizens, and several lawyers. Abreast it, with a small space between, was another and larger platform, handsomely canopied against sun and rain, and richly carpeted. Also it was furnished with comfortable chairs, and with two which were more sumptuous than the others, and raised above the general level. One of these two was occupied by a prince of the royal blood of England, his eminence the Cardinal of Winchester, the other by Cochon, Bishop of Beauvais. In the rest of the chairs sat three bishops, the vice-inquisitor, eight abbots, and the sixty-two friars and lawyers who had sat as Joan's judges in her late trials. Twenty steps in front of the platforms was another, a table-topped pyramid of stone, built up in retreating courses, thus forming steps. Out of this rose that grisly thing, the stake. About the stake bundles of faggots and firewood were piled. 
on the ground at the base of the pyramid stood three crimson figures the executioner and his assistants at their feet lay what had been a goodly heap of brands but was now a smokeless nest of ruddy coals a foot or two from this was a supplemental supply of wood and faggots compacted into a pile shoulder high and containing as much as six pack-horse loads think of that we seem so delicately made so destructible so insubstantial yet it is easier to reduce a granite statue to ashes than it is to do that with a man's body the sight of the stake sent physical pains tingling down the nerves of my body and yet turn as i would my eyes would keep coming back to it such fascination has the gruesome and the terrible for us the space occupied by the platforms and the stake was kept open by a wall of english soldiery standing elbow to elbow erect and stalwart figures fine and sightly in their polished steel while from behind them on every hand stretched far away a level plain of human heads and there was no window and no housetop within our view howsoever distant but was black with patches and masses of people but there was no noise no stir it was as if the world was dead the impressiveness of this silence and solemnity was deepened by a leaden twilight for the sky was hidden by a pall of low-hanging storm-clouds and above the remote horizon faint winkings of heat-lightning played and now and then one caught the dull mutterings and complainings of distant thunder at last the stillness was broken from beyond the square rose an indistinct sound but familiar court crisp phrases of command next i saw the plain of heads dividing and the steady swing of a marching host was glimpsed between my heart leapt for a moment was it la Hire and his hellions no that was not their gate no it was the prisoner and her escort it was joan of arc under guard that was coming my spirit sank as low as they had been before weak as she was they made her walk they would increase her weakness all they could the distance was not great it was but a few hundred yards but short as it was it was a heavy tax upon one who had been lying chained in one spot for months and whose feet had lost their powers from inaction yes and for a year joan had known only the cool damps of a dungeon and now she was dragging herself through this sultry summer heat this airless and suffocating void as she entered the gate drooping with exhaustion there was that creature loiseleur at her side with his head bent to her ear we knew afterward that he had been with her again this morning in the prison wearying her with his persuasions and enticing her with false promises and that he was now still at the same work at the gate imploring her to yield everything that would be required of her and assuring her that if she would do this all would be well with her she would be rid of the dreaded english and find safety in the powerful shelter and protection of the church a miserable man a stony-hearted man the moment joan was seated on the platform she closed her eyes and allowed her chin to fall and so sat with her hands nestling in her lap indifferent to everything caring for nothing but rest and she was so white again white as alabaster how the faces of that packed mass of humanity lighted up with interest and with what intensity all eyes gazed upon this fragile girl and how natural it was for these people realized that at last they were looking upon that person whom they had so long hungered to see a person whose name and fame filled all europe and made all other names and all other renowns insignificant by comparisons joan of arc the wonder of the time and destined to be the wonder of all times and i could read as by print in their marveling countenances the words that were drifting through their minds can it be true is it believable that it is this little creature this girl this child with the good face the sweet face the beautiful face the dear and bonny face that has carried fortresses by storm charged at the head of victorious armies blown the might of england out of her path with a breath and fought a long campaign solitary and alone against the massed brains and learning of france and had won it if the fight had been fair evidently cochon had grown afraid of manchon because of his pretty apparent leanings toward joan 
for another recorder was in the chief place here, which left my master and me nothing to do but sit idle and look on. Well, I supposed that everything had been done which could be thought of to tire Joan's body and mind, but it was a mistake. One more device had been invented. This was to preach a long sermon to her in that oppressive heat. When the preacher began, she cast up one distressed and disappointed look, then dropped her head again. This preacher was Guillaume Erard, an oratorical celebrity. He got his text from the Twelve Lies. He emptied upon Joan all the calumnies in detail that had been bottled up in that mass of venom, and called her all the brutal names that the Twelve were labeled with, working himself into a whirlwind of fury as he went on. But his labors were wasted. She seemed lost in dreams. She made no sign. She did not seem to hear. At last he launched this apostrophe. O oh, France, how hast thou been abused! Thou hast always been the home of Christianity. But now Charles, who calls himself thy king and governor, endorses, like the heretic and schismatic that he is, the words and deeds of a worthless and infamous woman. Joan raised her head, and her eyes began to burn and flash. The preacher turned to her. It is to you, Joan, that I speak, and I tell you that your king is schismatic and a heretic. Ah, he might abuse her to his heart's content. She could endure that, but to her dying moment she could never hear in patience a word against that ingrate, that treacherous dog, our king, whose proper place was here, at this moment, sword in hand, routing these reptiles and saving this most noble servant that ever king had in this world, and he would have been there if he had not been what I have called him. Joan's loyal soul was outraged, and she turned upon the preacher and flung out a few words with a spirit which the crowd recognized as being in accordance with the Joan of Arc traditions. "'By my faith, sir, I make bold to say and swear, on pain of death, that he is the most noble Christian of all Christians, and the best lover of the faith and the church. There was an explosion of applause from the crowd, which angered the preacher, for he had been aching long to hear an expression like this, and now that it was come at last, it had fallen to the wrong person. He had done all the work, the other had carried off all the spoil. He stamped his foot and shouted to the sheriff, "'Make her shut up!' That made the crowd laugh. A mob has small respect for a grown man who has to call on a sheriff to protect him from a sick girl. Joan had damaged the preacher's cause more with one sentence than he had helped it with a hundred, so he was much put out, and had trouble to get a good start again. But he needn't have bothered. There was no occasion. It was mainly an English-feeling mob. It had but obeyed a law of our nature, an irresistible law, to enjoy and applaud a spirited and promptly delivered retort, no matter who makes it. The mob was with the preacher. It had been beguiled for a moment, but only that. It would soon return. It was there to see this girl burnt, so that it got that satisfaction, without too much delay. It would be content. Presently the preacher formally summoned Joan to submit to the church. He made the demand with confidence, for he had gotten the idea from Loisleur and Beaupère that she was worn to the bone, exhausted, and would not be able to put forth any more resistance. And, indeed, to look at her it seemed that they must be right. Nevertheless, she made one more effort to hold her ground, and said wearily, "'As to that matter, I have answered my judges before. I have told them to report all that I have said and done to our Holy Father the Pope, to whom and to God first I appeal. Again out of her native wisdom she had brought those words of tremendous import, but was ignorant of their value. But they could have availed her nothing in any case now, with the stake there and these thousands of enemies about her. Yet they made every churchman there blench, and the preacher changed the subject with all haste. Well might those criminals blench, for Joan's appeal of her case to the Pope stripped Cochon at once of jurisdiction over it, and annulled all that he and his judges had already done in the matter, and all that they should do in it henceforth. Joan went on presently to reiterate, after some further talk, 
that she had acted by command of God in her deeds and utterances. Then, when an attempt was made to implicate the king and friends of hers and his, she stopped that. She said, I charge my deeds and words upon no one, neither upon my king nor any other. If there is any fault in them, I am responsible, and no other. She was asked if she would not recant those of her words and deeds which had been pronounced evil by her judges. Her answer made confusion and damage again. I submit them to God and the Pope. The Pope once more. It was very embarrassing. Here was a person who was asked to submit her case to the Church, and who frankly consents, offers to submit it to the very head of it. What more could any one require? How was one to answer such a formidably unanswerable answer as that? The worried judges put their heads together and whispered and planned and discussed. Then they brought forth this sufficiently shambling conclusion, but it was the best they could do, in so close a place. They said the Pope was so far away, and it was not necessary to go to him anyway, because the present judges had sufficient power and authority to deal with the present case, and were in effect the Church to that extent. At another time they could have smiled at this conceit, but not now. They were not comfortable enough now. The mob was getting impatient. It was beginning to put on a threatening aspect. It was tired of standing, tired of the scorching heat and the thunder was coming nearer. The lightning was flashing brighter. It was necessary to hurry this matter to a close. Erard showed Joan a written form, which had been prepared and made all ready beforehand, and asked her to abjure. Abjure? What is abjure? She did not know the word. It was explained to her by Monsieur. She tried to understand, but she was breaking under exhaustion, and she could not gather the meaning. It was all a jumble and confusion of strange words. In her despair she sent out this beseeching cry, I appeal to the Church Universal whether I ought to abjure or not. Herard exclaimed, You shall abjure instantly, or instantly be burnt. She glanced up at those awful words, and for the first time she saw the stake and the mass of red coals redder and angrier than ever now under the constantly deepening storm-gloom. She gasped and staggered up out of her seat, muttering and mumbling incoherently, and gazed vacantly upon the people and the scene about her like one who is dazed, or thinks he dreams, and does not know where he is. The priests crowded about her, imploring her to sign the paper. There were many voices beseeching and urging her at once, there was great turmoil and shouting and excitement among the populace and everywhere. Sign! Sign! from the priests. Sign! Sign and be saved! And Loisleur was urging at her ear, Do as I told you. Do not destroy yourself. Joan said plaintively to these people, Ah, you do not do well to seduce me. The judges joined their voices to the others, Yes, even the iron in their hearts melted, and they said, Oh, Joan, we pity you so. Take back what you have said, or we must deliver you up to punishment. And now there was another voice. It was from the other platform, pealing solemnly above the din, Cochon's reading the sentence of death. Joan's strength was all spent. She stood looking about her in a bewildered way a moment, then slowly she sank to her knees and bowed her head and said, I submit. They gave her no time to reconsider. They knew the peril of that. The moment the words were out of her mouth, Monsieur was reading to her the abjuration, and she was repeating the words after him mechanically, unconsciously, and smiling, for her wandering mind was far away in some happier world. Then this short paper of six lines was slipped aside, and a long one of many pages was smuggled into its place, and she, noting nothing, put her mark on it, saying, in pathetic apology, that she did not know how to write. But a secretary of the King of England was there to take care of that defect. He guided her hand with his own and wrote her name, Jehan. The great crime was accomplished. She had signed. What? She did not know. But the others knew. 
she had signed a paper confessing herself a sorceress, a dealer with devils, a liar, a blasphemer of God and his angels, a lover of blood, a promoter of sedition, cruel, wicked, commissioned of Satan, and this signature of hers bound her to resume the dress of a woman. There were other promises, but that one would answer without the others, and that one could be made to destroy her. Loiseleur pressed forward and praised her for having done such a good day's work, but she was still dreamy, she hardly heard. Then Cochon pronounced the words which dissolved the excommunication and restored her to her beloved church with all the dear privileges of worship. Ah, she heard that. You could see it in the deep gratitude that rose in her face and transfigured it with joy. But how transient was that happiness! For Cochon, without a tremor of pity in his voice, added these crushing words. And that she may repent of her crimes and repeat them no more, she is sentenced to perpetual imprisonment with the bread of affliction and the water of anguish. Perpetual imprisonment. She had never dreamed of that. Such a thing had never been hinted to her by Loiseleur or by any other. Loiseleur had distinctly said and promised that all would be well with her, and the very last words spoken to her by Erard on that very platform, when he was urging her to abjure, was a straight, unqualified promise that if she would do it, she should go free from captivity. She stood stunned and speechless a moment. Then she remembered, with such solacement as the thought could furnish, that by another clear promise made by Cochon himself, she would at least be the church's captive and have women about her in place of a brutal foreign soldiery. So she turned to the body of priests and said with a sad resignation, Now, you men of the church, take me to your prison, and leave me no longer in the hands of the English. And she gathered up her chains and prepared to move. But alas, now came these shameful words from Cochon, and with them a mocking laugh. Take her to the prison whence she came! poor abused girl she stood dumb smitten paralyzed it was pitiful to see she had been beguiled lied to betrayed she saw it all now the rumbling of a drum broke upon the stillness and for just one moment she thought of the glorious deliverance promised by her voices i read it in the rapture that lit her face then she saw what it was her prison escort and that light faded, never to revive again. And now her head began a piteous rocking motion, swaying slowly this way and that, as is the way when one is suffering unwordable pain, or when one's heart is broken. Then, drearily, she went from us, with her face in her hands, and sobbing bitterly. End of chapter 20 Book 3, Chapter 21 respited only for torture. There is no certainty that any one in all Rouen was in the secret of the deep game which Cochon was playing, except the Cardinal of Winchester. Then you can imagine the astonishment and stupefaction of that vast mob gathered there, and those crowds of churchmen assembled on the two platforms, when they saw Joan of Arc moving away, alive and whole, slipping out of their grip at last after all this tedious waiting, all this tantalizing expectancy. Nobody was able to stir or speak for a while, so paralyzing was the universal astonishment, so unbelievable the fact that the stake was actually standing there unoccupied, and its prey gone. Then, suddenly, everybody broke into a fury of rage. Maledictions and charges of treachery began to fly freely, yes, and even stones, a stone came near killing the Cardinal of Winchester. It just missed his head. But the man who threw it was not to blame, for he was excited, and a man who is excited never can throw straight. The tumult was very great indeed for a while. In the midst of it a chaplain of the Cardinal even forgot the proprieties so far as to opprobriously assail the august Bishop of Beauvais himself, shaking his fist in his face and shouting, "'By God, you are a traitor!' "'You lie!' responded the bishop. "'He a traitor! Oh, far from it. 
He certainly was the last Frenchman that any Briton had a right to bring that charge against. The Earl of Warwick lost his temper, too. He was a doughty soldier, but when it came to the intellectuals, when it came to delicate chicane and scheming and treachery, he couldn't see any further through a millstone than another. So he burst out in his frank warrior fashion, and swore that the King of England was being treacherously used, and that Joan of Arc was going to be allowed to cheat the stake, but they whispered comfort into his ear. "'Give yourself no uneasiness, my lord. We shall soon have her again.' Perhaps the like tidings found their way all around, for good news travels fast as well as bad. At any rate, the ragings presently quieted down, and the huge concourse crumbled apart and disappeared. And thus we reached the noon of that fearful Thursday. We two youths were happy, happier than any words can tell, for we were not in the secret any more than the rest. Joan's life was saved. We knew that, and that was enough. France would hear of this day's infamous work, and then—why, then her gallant sons would flock to her standard by thousands and thousands, multitudes upon multitudes, and their wrath would be like the wrath of the ocean when the storm-winds sweep it, and they would hurl themselves against this doomed city, and overwhelm it like the resistless tides of that ocean, and Joan of Arc would march again. In six days, seven days, one short week, noble France, grateful France, indignant France, would be thundering at these gates. Let us count the hours, let us count the minutes, let us count the seconds. O oh, happy day, O oh, day of ecstasy, how our hearts sang in our bosoms! For we were young then. Yes, we were very young. Do you think the exhausted prisoner was allowed to rest and sleep? after she had spent the small remnant of her strength in dragging her tired body back to the dungeon? No, there was no rest for her, with those sleuth-hounds on her track. Cochon and some of his people followed her to her lair straightaway. They found her dazed and dull, her mental and physical forces in a state of prostration. They told her she had abjured, that she had made certain promises, among them, to resume the apparel of her sex, and that if she relapsed, the church would cast her out for good and all. She heard the words, but they had no meaning to her. She was like a person who has taken a narcotic and is dying for sleep, dying for rest from nagging, dying to be let alone, and who mechanically does everything the persecutor asks, taking but dull note of the things done, and but dully recording them in the memory. And so Joan put on the gown which Cochon and his people had brought, and would come to herself by and by, and have at first but a dim idea as to when and how the change had come about. Cochon went away happy and content. Joan had resumed woman's dress without protest. Also she had been formally warned against relapsing. He had witnesses to these facts. How could matters be better? But suppose she should not relapse? Why, then, she must be forced to do it. Did Cochon hint to the English guards that thenceforth, if they chose to make their prisoners' captivity crueler and bitterer than ever, no official notice would be taken of it? Perhaps so, since the guards did begin that policy at once, and no official notice was taken of it. Yes, from that moment Joan's life in that dungeon was made almost unendurable. Do not ask me to enlarge upon it. I will not do it. So I, I was sorry to end on chapter 21, but that was kind of really the best place in the grand scheme of things. But Twain hints at the end of 21 of bad behavior on the part of the English guards. There, to the best of my knowledge, there is no actual record of what truly happened to Joan after this particular part of her trials. The conventional wisdom, I guess you could say, is that she was very likely assaulted by her guards at this point. Once she was out of her men's clothes and back into uh, women's clothes, that was likely what happened to her. Twain certainly seems to feel that to be true. This is also, uh, these three chapters are the first time that we really get to see where Couchon has wound up in his machinations, having to set Joan up. The people in the town 
at this point were angry at the ecclesiastical group because they had wanted to see Joan Byrne. They wanted their show. They had their popcorn. They wanted a show. They were robbed of the chance for that entertainment. I'm putting all of that in ugly air quotes. Couchant knows that one way or another he is going to get her. And he knows he can pull this off because she has not gone back to a different prison, a prison run by the church. She's gone back to the prison that's run by the British. So, yeah, it's several really ugly chapters. And again, if this were fiction, it would be melodrama. It would be kind of over the top, like, really, guys? <sighs> Come on. <laughs> Nobody could be that evil. And yet, yeah, huh? Because history. So that is very sad. We also, in these chapters, get the first, I think really the first point where Twain's voice comes really strongly through Louis de Comte's character when talking about the Dauphin, the now king, and the fact that he has not shown up to say a word about Joan. And I will talk more about that next week, what, why that's happening, what his reasoning may have been, because as far as I know, he never really spoke on the subject overtly. There are some real reasons why uh, he did not show up here. He, yeah, I'm going to talk about the rest of it next week. But yeah, this is where we're at. Joan has, without realizing it, signed a pretty major confession about all sorts of nasty things that she was supposed to have done. Even though it was a dirty trick and everybody knew it, it didn't matter. And, and now she's stuck. But this isn't the end yet. We have three more chapter chapters and then a conclusion for next week. So there is still more to come. All right, I'm going to go back to packing. <laughs> You're going to go back to living your life, and I will talk to you again next week. Be well, go by Valent, take care of each other. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>